Okay, children may be dismissed to Children's Church. You can go ahead and open your Bibles to uh, 1 Kings, um, or actually, I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 12 this morning. We're reaching the end of our study of Elijah, and I think uh, many of us were surprised to uh, find that we could learn so much uh, from him. His story is a relatable example for us as we're reminded of that truth from James chapter 5 that says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Um, Elijah's life has been a whirlwind of activity from the time he stepped out of nowhere to confront the king of Israel to his adventures of faith at the dry brook and the widow's house in Zarephath to his great victory on Mount Carmel and his fall into and his restoration from defeat and discouragement. Life, Elijah's life has been temptuous, to say the least. Now that life is about to end. The narrator here begins by giving away the secret of what's going to happen. Usually storytellers save the climax for the very end and keep the listener in suspense until then. But our story begins with these words. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to the heaven by a whirlwind. He will leave here like he lived here, in a whirlwind. As Elijah lives out the last days and hours of his life, it's interesting to see how he conducted himself. So let's go ahead and read this passage of Scripture, First, or 2 Kings chapter 2, 1 through 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to the heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master, master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, it and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And he saw him no more. There was a country song several years ago by Tim McGraw about a man that received the news that his time was short. I'm sure many of you may be familiar with it. It's called Live Like You Were Dying. And I'm just going to write a, a few lines from it. He says, he asked him, I was in my early 40s with a lot of life before me when a moment came that stopped me on a dime. I spent most of the next days looking at the x-rays and talking about the options and talking about sweet time. 
I asked him, when it sank in that this might really be the real end, how has it hit you when you get that kind of news? Man, what'd you do? And he said, well, I went skydiving. I went Rocky Mountain climbing. I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And I loved deeper, and I spoke sweeter, and I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. He said, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. And of course, I didn't do that as well as Tim McGraw, but it's a, it's a story about living life to the fullest, not putting things off, making things right. There's some, there's some great sentiments in that song. But what about our man, Elijah? What did he do when he got the news? He did not live like a man who knew his time was short. He actually lives like a man who who thinks he has plenty of time. Elijah sets a a great example for those who are, are waiting for that time when we will leave this world. If we're honest, every safe person here would probably admit that they're anxiously awaiting that time when they will be home with the Lord. But what are we to be doing here in the meantime while we wait? What are we to be doing? Well, Elijah shows us in this passage. As we we read this, we find there are three ways that Elijah spent his time as he waited on the whirlwind. By the way, just so you know, as a, as a way of reference, whirlwind in the Old Testament often referred to the presence of the Lord. So just keep that in mind. One of these days, all of our journeys will be over. Those who are saved will leave this world either, either by the cemetery or by the way of the rapture. Either way, we will leave here in a whirlwind, swept away into the very presence of God. Amen. Until that day, we must live our lives in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, in a way that honors His will. Elijah shows us how to do just that. Let's look in on Elijah, see the the ways he spent his time as he was waiting on the whirlwind. The first thing we notice Elijah doing is found in verse 1. He was watching. He was watching for something precious. According to this verse, Elijah knew the precious truth that he was going to get to go to heaven without having to pass through death. This was a privilege that had only been enjoyed by one other person, Enoch. Genesis 5, chapter or chapter 5, 21 through 24, tells us of this man who lived for and walked with the Lord. And when his time was over, God simply took Enoch to heaven without him having to die first. This was the precious event that Elijah was waiting for, what he was anticipating, that he was watching for. By the way, this is something that could happen to you and me. The Bible tells us that there will be a future event known as the rapture. The trumpet will sound. The Lord will descend and he will call his people home. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, The Lord will descend, the voice of an archangel. And we will will be drawn up. We will meet the Lord in the air. Amen. It's a precious event that could happen to us at any moment. At any moment. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52 says that some of us will not sleep. That means that some of us will not die before this happens. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye when the trumpet sounds. And we will be drawn up to him. And when it does, we'll go to heaven without having to die to get there. That excites me. Doesn't that excite you? To not have to die? To just be called up to heaven in the rapture? 
I say, that's a precious event to not have to step through death's door. That's the precious event that Elijah was anticipating. If you're If you are saved, you should be anticipating that event too. Jesus is coming, and he is coming soon. I'm I'm convinced that he is coming sooner than any of us realize. Revelation 22.20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Like John said, I, I say, Amen, Lord Jesus, come. Come. I'm ready. I'm ready. We are to be watching for the precious, precious return of our Lord. And then we're to be watching for something promised. As we, as we read these verses, you see pretty quick that everyone knew, everyone knew what was coming. The sons of the prophets knew. They, they, they said many times to Elisha, don't you know? Elisha knew. He says, yes, I know. Be quiet. As I already said, Elijah knew. He knew all about it. This wasn't a secret event. It wasn't a secret. It was something that people had heard about and they could prepare themselves for. Everyone knew. They could prepare. It is the same with Christ's return. It is the same with Christ's return. This isn't something that has been hidden from mankind. Jesus said it during his time here on earth. In John chapter 14, 1 through 3, he says, In my Father's house are are many rooms, many rooms. And I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And I go, if I go to prepare a place, I will come back. I will take you so that you can be where I am. The New Testament authors predicted it repeatedly. Paul, John, and Peter all spoke about it. It's well documented on the pages of the Bible. Preachers preach about it all the time. Jesus is coming back. So there is no excuse for this to be taking anyone by surprise. There is no excuse for not being ready for the return of Jesus Christ. There's no excuse. Everybody has heard. If you're saved, but your life isn't really what you would want Jesus to find when he comes back, then do something about it. You know he's coming back. You know he is coming back. If you're not ready, there's things in your life that aren't aren't quite right. Do something about it. If you're lost and you you don't want to be left here for the hell of, of the tribulation or the hell of hell, then do something about that too. Do something about that. While you still have time, the door for you to be saved is wide open this morning. It is wide open. If you will come to Jesus by faith, he will save your soul and he will prepare you for his return. His return is precious and it is promised. Are you ready? Are you ready? So he was watching for something precious, for something promised, and for something that was private. Even though all these people knew it was coming, no one knew exactly when it would happen. Sure, they kept telling Elisha, don't you know that today the Lord is going to take your master from over you? But that's, that's like us saying, we're, well, we're living in the last times. We're in the, we're in the last days. These, these are the end of times. See, Elijah knew that God was coming for him, but he didn't know exactly when. So he lived his last days and hours in anticipation of that coming event. The same should be true for us as we wait for the return of Jesus. The Bible clearly tells us that it will happen, but it also clearly tells us that we don't know when it will happen. Matthew 24, 36, but at about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father knows. No one knows that moment. 
He's kept that day and that hour private. He's kept it private. No one else knows when. Matthew 24, 40 through, 43 through 44. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. That's why. That's why he doesn't let you know when it's going to happen. He wants you to be ready at every moment. Because if you knew, if you knew the exact hour, the exact moment, you would just live your life any way that you wanted. You would just go and do whatever you wanted to do, and it's like, uh oh, I got 30 minutes. Well, let me get my suit on, let me go to church, let me get, let me get my Bible out. I want, I want Jesus to be impressed when he comes back. It will happen in the twinkling of an eye. So we must be ready for his coming at any time. If you aren't ready, the time to get ready is now. Whatever you have to deal with, take care of business now. Don't think that you have time to do it later. It could be now. It could be now. It could be now. It could be now. I told you last week, then it's too late. Then it's too late. It's like the world wouldn't came for Elijah. Jesus is coming for you, for me. So the question remains, are you ready? Are you ready? Elijah was watching as he was waiting for the whirlwind. He was also walking. See that in verses 2 through 11. He was walking purposefully. In verses 1 through 6, as Elijah anticipated his departure, he continued to live as he always had. He continued to walk in humble obedience before the Lord. Notice what he says is in verses 2, 4, and 6. The Lord has sent me. The Lord has sent me. Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me. And then he went from town to town that the Lord sent him to. He met with the student prophets, the, the seminary students, and he, he encouraged them. If Elijah would have been like many today, he would have just spent his last days on the earth in retirement. He would have spent his, his time doing all those things he hadn't had time to do while he was active serving the Lord, you know, like Tim McGraw, Tim McGraw's song, you know, skydiving and Rocky Mountain climbing and riding a bull named Fu Manchu. But Elijah knew the truth that many people never learn. There is no higher call and no greater fulfillment than following the Lord and doing what He calls you to do. Amen. Amen. Elijah continued to walk with purpose. He continued to walk with purpose. Here's a lesson for us in that. You've heard me say it many times, and you will hear me say it again many times. There will never come a day when you can quit serving the Lord. There will never come a day when you can quit serving the Lord. There is no retirement in the Bible. There is no retirement in the Bible. There is no retiring from serving the Lord. <clears throat> Even though we know we're leaving and it could be today, we, could, we should still live lives that are filled with purpose to our calling. Several years ago, it seems like every few years you hear about a group of people Several years ago, I remember hearing about this group of people in Texas who were convinced that they had figured out the exact moment of Jesus' return. They had figured out the date. And so they sold all their stuff, quit their jobs, and they went to the top of this mountain to wait for his return. 
waited for the rapture. Someone is always trying to figure out that day, aren't they? I mean, you can't hardly turn on a, a, a televangelist channel and, and somebody's got, oh, I figured out today. I've got it. I got it figured out, guys. They'll never be able to figure it out. They'll never be able to figure it out. I already told you, God doesn't want you to know that moment. That is not what God wants you and me to be doing, to be trying to figure out that date and then go sell all our stuff and then just sit and wait for him. Look in the sky. Is that him? No, no, no. Oh, is that him over there? No. No, he wants us to be busy in his work until he returns to take us home to glory. He wants to come back and catch us working. If you want to take another biblical example, look to the book of Nehemiah. The nation of Israel faced fierce opposition from their enemies, and and, and Nehemiah and his workers, as as they're rebuilding the walls of Jericho, they worked with one hand and held a weapon in the other. They watched, and they worked, all at the same time, purposefully. I will say it again. There will never come a day when what? When what? When you can quit serving the Lord. If you've been guilty of quitting on the Lord Let me encourage you to pick up your tools again. Pick up your tools. There's work to be done. Let us work until Jesus comes for us. Continue to walk purposefully and progressively. Verses 1 through 7, as the Lord led Elijah from place to place, God was bringing him closer and closer to the place where he planned to remove him from this world. For Elijah, these places he visited allowed him the opportunity to to visit the schools of the prophets. We might look at them as, as seminaries. Gave him opportunity to talk to these young men who were training to serve the Lord, to be an encouragement to them. Keep going. Keep going, guys. It's going to get hard some days. But don't quit. Don't be scared. Let me tell you about the time I, I, I stared down the prophets of Baal. Sometimes you will mess up. I ran away from Jezebel, but God will provide, guys. Keep going. These places also gave Elijah the opportunity to to reminisce, reminisce about his life, how the Lord had worked in it so powerfully, so wonderfully. You know, oftentimes we say, you know, our life flashes before our eyes, but this was a a walk down memory lane for Elijah. We're going to take a moment to look at each of these places that Elijah visited and, and the significance that they held for him. First is is Gilgal. Gilgal was the first place Israel camped when they crossed the Jordan and entered into the promised land. Gilgal was a place of new beginnings. It was a place of new beginnings. Here they were near the battles, but they weren't fighting them quite yet. It was a place of of safety, of of preparation, of, of communion with the Lord. It's here that they renewed their covenants. They grew stronger in their relationship with the Lord. It's where the younger generation was circumcised. It's where where they celebrated their first Passover in the promised land. For Elijah, it was a time for him to remember how it all began for him. How it all began for him. How the Lord called him and and filled him to, to use him for the glory of God. And then Bethel. Bethel was a holy place for the people of Israel. It was at Bethel that the patriarch Jacob had met, had met the Lord God. Where Jacob's ladder, he saw Jacob's ladder there. Bethel signified the place of the altar of of total dependence upon the Lord. 
Bethel was a place of, of revelation. It was called the house of God, where God became known, where he became big in, in the eyes of those who worship him. For Elijah, Bethel was a, a place to reflect upon all the altars he'd experienced in his life as, as God revealed himself to him. He remembered how his life had, had been lived in, in total dependence on the Lord. And Jericho, for the people of Israel, Jericho represented the power of God to give victory in the day of battle. It's a place of their first major conquest in the promised land. Jericho was a place of victory and power as you live by faith. As you live by faith. Jericho was a place for Elijah to remember all the great victories he'd had. He could reflect on all the great things God had done for and through him. Times like being fed by the ravens or the endless jar of flour and oil or the widow's son being brought back to life or the victory on Mount Carmel. All of those things would have flooded Elijah's mind. He was there in Jericho. He remembered a a life of powerful victories as he lived by faith. And then the Jordan. Through Israel, the the river Jordan marked the end of their wilderness wanderings. It was a picture of death and life. I mean, it it was a place where the pilgrims died. The slaves set free. When they crossed the Jordan, they were no longer pilgrims. They were no longer slaves. They were people who had arrived home and were now truly free. Jordan was a place of death to your old life. A birth into a new one. For Elijah, it was a perfect place to reflect on all the ways he had died to self during his years as as a man of God. There he could reflect on the fact that he had lived a selfless life, that he had lived a life to the glory of God. He would soon be leaving this life behind. And he would be entering into the glorious new life of promise. Glorious new life of promise that he had been waiting for. What does this all mean for us? Well, Elijah's travel show us the progression of the normal Christian life. A bit of that progressive sanctification that I like to talk so much about. Gilgal, we must first have our Gilgal experience. There must be a time of new beginnings when we personally meet the Lord. Jesus himself said it this way, you must be born again. When we, when we start over, a, a new start to the life that we were meant to live. There we're safe and we're brought into communion with the Lord. It's a time of spiritual preparations for the, the battles that surely lay ahead for a Christian's walk. And Bethel, then as we grow in the Lord and learn to pray, we come to that Bethel time of our walk with Jesus. At Bethel we learn to walk in dependence on the Lord place of maturity, growing in our faith as he reveals himself to us. Jericho, if we grow as we should, we'll come to our Jericho experience. This is where we we see the Lord give us victories over the battles of life. Here we will see the flesh and the world and the devil defeated as we live victoriously for the Lord. And eventually we'll face our own Jordan. We will come to the end of our journey just as Elijah did. Of course, the Jordan isn't a bad place. It's it's merely a doorway into the presence and the blessing of the Lord. A doorway that leads us to our final step, glory. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll, I'll fight life's final war with pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future, life is worth the living. 
just because he lives. One day we will arrive in that place that Elijah went to, heaven, to live in the very presence of the Lord. In the meantime, the Lord wants to grow us and to fashion us into his image. As he leads us from place to place along the road of life, may we, like Elijah, simply follow in humble obedience to his will for us. For all, the greatest gift we give the Lord is ourselves, totally surrendered and dedicated to His will. To offer ourselves as a living sacrifice according to Romans 12. To continue to seek after Him, to grow in wisdom and faith and love and service. Christian life is, is not meant to be a life of stagnation. It's meant to be a life of progression, moving forward. That's why we call it our spiritual walk. It's not our our spiritual sit. It's not our spiritual stand, although we do make stands in our faith. But we walk in our faith. Like Elijah, we must continue walking progressively, advancing. Next, we must also walk publicly. As Elijah traveled his last miles on earth, he did not, to try, not, did not try to travel them alone. Verses 2, 4, and 6 might make you think that Elijah wanted Elisha to stay behind. He said, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me. However, those are really just tests for Elisha. Elisha had said that he would follow, so Elijah was testing his commitment. We're going to talk about that more in another time, but Verses 6, 8, and 9, and 11 tell us the story. As the Lord lives, I will never leave. And at the end, my father, my father, Elisha calls after Elijah. He's not talking about the Lord. He's talking about his spiritual father, his, his mentor. He's now gone. These verses speak of friendship and fellowship. As Elijah completed his last tasks on earth, he didn't try to do them alone. He didn't become depressed and run and hide alone in the wilderness like he did when when Jezebel promised to kill him. Remember when he did that? You're as good as dead. He ran and hid, became depressed. Now the Lord, who is way more powerful, says he's coming for him. Elijah, I'm coming for you. He didn't hide himself from those who could encourage him. He continued to walk in fellowship with other believers. He he visited the schools of the prophets and gave them words of encouragement. He he walked with his friend and his his protege, Elisha. Elijah knew that he needed others in his life. There are too many lone ranger Christians in our day. Far too many believers act as if they need no one else in their life. Like that makes them some kind of tough guy. Well, I don't need anyone. I'm just fine all by myself. All I need is the Lord. The truth is we need each other. We need each other. We need good, godly fellowship and friendship. He put us in a body for a reason. We can't survive alone. Even Jesus recognized the need for that kind of relationship in his own life. When when he went to the garden to pray, he took three special friends with him. He asked them to watch and to pray with him. When he finds them asleep, he's, he's disappointed that they couldn't stand with him during that lonely hour in his time of, of need. That's why we're told not to forsake the assembly. And then it says, all the more as you see the day drawing near. All the more as you see the the day draw near. As different as we are from each other, whether we will admit to it or not, we need one another. We're a ragtag group of misfits that the Lord has brought together. Should examine our relationship with other believers this morning. If it isn't what it ought to be, then do something about it. 
Do something about it. Is your relationship with your brothers and sisters here? Is it superficial? Are you, are you truly depending and encouraging one another? We were put together to support each other on our walk of faith. Our walk of faith should be purposeful, progressive, and public. While Elijah was waiting on the world, when he was watching, he was walking, and he was working. I've already touched on this, but Elijah did not spend his last day sitting on the bench doing nothing. He was busy doing the work that the Lord had given him until the instant God called him. Till the instant God called him. He sets an example that we should all follow. He was trusting his Redeemer. Notice what he was doing he, as he was waiting. He was trusting his Redeemer. Even at the end of his life, Elijah is still walking by faith. When, when he and, and Elisha come to the River Jordan, they need to get across. So Elijah does what he always did. And he expected the impossible from God. And he received it by faith. He rolled up his cloak and he struck the water and it immediately parted. Elijah and Elisha crossed over on dry land. His actions remind us of Moses and his staff and and parting the Red Sea and and the ark. When the Israel uh, crossed over the Jordan. See, it seems that Elijah never reached a place in his life where he said, well, I've seen all that the Lord can do, all that he's able to do. I've probably used up my allotment of miracles, probably used up my allotment. He just kept walking by faith and independence in the Lord until the very end. No matter how long you may walk with the Lord, no matter what you've seen Him do, no matter what He has done through your life, there should never come a day when you should stop trusting Him. Trusting Him to do the impossible in your life. Till we stand in His presence in heaven, we are to walk by faith. Nothing less will please Him. Elijah kept working, trusting and training his replacement. As they walk together, Elijah spends his last moments with Elijah teaching him about obedience and faithfulness. What can I do for you, Elisha, before I go? How can I help you? What can I do? What do you need? I'm going to be leaving soon. And I won't be around. So what Before I go, what do you need? What do you need to learn? What can I explain to you? I want a double portion. Well, Elisha, that's up to God. In the meantime, keep watching. Keep watching. Keep learning. Elijah doesn't pat Elisha on the shoulder and walk off into the sunset. Well, this is about the end for me. This is it. Good luck, Elisha. You're going to need it. Good luck. No, he knows Elisha is going to take his place someday. He knows that Elisha needs and deserves the best training that he can be given. The future depends on Elijah doing his duty today. Before he leaves, he must hand down his ministry to the next generation. As we near the end of our own road, there is another generation coming behind us. Many of them are downstairs right now, right below us. That's the next generation. That's the next generation. What are we teaching them about faith, hope, and love? Obedience to God and His Word. Faithfulness to the Lord's church and the the work He gives us. Love for the Bible. Love for His people. and Serving one another. What are we teaching them? What kind of legacy are we leaving behind as we travel toward our crossing? We, we are here because 
people were faithful to hand down their faith to us. The whole 2 Timothy 2 thing. Our responsibility to those who follow is to give them what they need to get the job done for Jesus. Men, it is our job to teach these young men and boys. Men, it is our job, it is our duty to teach these young men, these boys, how men of God are supposed to conduct themselves. Don't complain about the next generation. Train the next generation. They must be taught what a real man is. God's definition, not Hollywood's, not the world's definition. They need to know how to love their wives and how to treat their children, how to provide for their families, how to to live for God in a wicked world. They need to be taught that a man's word is his bond, that marriage vows mean something, honor and integrity. They need a good, godly example, and you are called to be just that. Titus 2, 2, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Your influence extends beyond the walls of your own house. You have a responsibility to all the young people in this church. You have a responsibility to all all the young people in this church to set the right example in faithfulness and in holiness. Ladies, it's your responsibility to teach the young women and girls how to live as godly women before the Lord. It is your responsibility. The Bible is clear when it says in Titus 2, 3 through 5, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. They need to be taught how to act, how to dress, and how to treat their husbands and their children. They need, to, they need to be shown how to live for God. It is your duty. Ladies, it is your duty. Train up the next generation of godly women. Don't wag your heads when you turn on the TV or look at your Facebook or Instagram when you see these, 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 these half-clad Girls shaking their bodies all over the place. Don't just wag your heads. Train them. Train them. Teach them about modesty. Many of you are godly ladies that you are today because someone in your past set the right example for you, showed you how a woman of God is to live. It's quite a challenge for all of us. Quite a challenge for all of us. Men, ladies, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing with that? Are you training the next generation? Are you setting the example? Are you just complaining, wagging your head? Get busy. Get to work training the next generation. Elijah kept working, trusting, training, and traveling his road. Verse 11, there is the phrase, they still went on. It says they still went on. Even though he was nearing the the end of his life, Elijah never stopped. Even Even though the end was near, he kept 
going. He never said, Tag, Elisha, you're it. You keep going. I'm going to sit down right here. You keep going. This is where I get off. In fact, he was still going on when the Lord sent that chariot of fire to come and get him and bring him to glory. As they were going, as they went on and were talking, poof, the chariot of fire separated them. He was caught working. He was caught training. He was caught traveling. He was still going on. Can you even imagine what that would have been like to see? To see that? Can you imagine what it would have been like to experience that? What an exit Elijah had, right? It's an impressive way to leave. But as impressive as that is, what impresses me more is what Elijah did as he waited on the whirlwind. He just remained faithful, kept on serving the Lord, like he was going to live another hundred years. What a lesson. What a lesson for us. The Lord might come for you and me today. The rapture could take place at any moment. Or today could be that day that you leave through death's door. We know all too well how suddenly that can happen. You never know when your number is up. But you know it, should, it shouldn't really matter, though, because we're called to serve the Lord today. May we never come to a, a place where we sit down on Him and say, well, I've done enough. I've done enough. Someone else can take over from here. No. Let us all resolve to be like Elijah. That we will still go on until until the Lord calls us to leave this world. May we be caught working for Him. I know that I'm speaking to some who have sat down on God. And if that's you, it's time for you to get up. Get up and get back in the battle. Pick up your tools. Get back to work. Some of you aren't even walking with the Lord at all today. You've never even had that Gilgal experience. You aren't looking for the Lord's return, at least not eagerly, because if He did, you know you would be in sad shape. It's time for you to come to Jesus and to be saved Today. Today. Others are in the thick of the fight today. You're tempted to quit. Stop walking with the Lord. That's you. You need to renew your commitment to the Lord. Today is a day when great victories can be won by those willing to walk with the Lord. You are waiting on the world one that will take you out of this world because one way or another, you are going to leave. Are you ready? Are you ready? Do you know where it will take you? Are you prepared for that day? If not, get prepared today. What do you need to take care of? Come to Him today. Do it today. You may not have tomorrow or the next moment. Are you watching? Are you watching for that promise, that precious promise? Jesus is coming back. No one knows the hour or the day. Are you walking purposefully, progressively, publicly? Are you working, trusting, training, traveling? Pray that we all would be until that very moment when we will be transformed. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye 
And we will be in the presence, the very presence of the Lord. What a day that will be. What a day that will be. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for your word. And Father, we thank you for the example that you leave in your word for us. The example of godly people. Godly people with amazing testimonies. And yet, like Elijah, men, people with a nature like ours. Father, I pray that you would help us to to learn from their example, from their testimony. Father, that we would realize that you are coming back one day. It could happen at any moment. I pray that we would be ready, that we would be watching. We would be watching for that precious promise. That we would be walking purposely, progressively, and, and growing in our faith with, alongside the brothers and sisters that you have given us. That we would be working continually trusting you and and training the next generation and continuing to travel on this road that you have given us. Father, I pray that there is anyone here that is not ready for that day, that they would not leave here till they were. Father, again, I, I just thank you for your love and your grace and your patience to us. And Father, Pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to to follow the example that has been given to us. Thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together as we close in song.
Amen. He's coming back. Are you ready? Are you ready? Get ready. Don't leave here today until you are ready for his return. Amen? Amen.